So um, we started the Island Bitcoin community um, in Jamaica, but the goal is for it to spread across all the Caribbean islands and coastal countries as well of the Caribbean. And um, the high level goal is to really coordinate and help us all have a louder voice. And um, once we are able to do this at a larger scale, I think we'll, we'll realize that the world is shifting from what it used to be in terms of getting money into countries and out of countries and realizing now that money moves across cyberspace. It doesn't move across country lines anymore. Yeah. And the world has to adopt this new reality and then eventually govern around it and regulate around it. But first they have to realize it's happening. And I think that's our advantage as Bitcoiners. And I think that gives me a lot more positivity, a lot more optimism about the future. I feel like we're going into a phase where there can be a short dark period during a conversion of sorts, but there also can be a lot of bright spots and eventually a very, very beautiful age of abundance that I see coming for us. Bitcoiners, welcome to another episode of the ABC podcast. Today I'm really happy and glad because today we have an incredible guest uh, with us. He is a devout uh, builder and also a community leader in the Bitcoin space in the Caribbean. He is uh, revolutionizing how the people in the Caribbean uh, connect with uh, Bitcoin. He's also a founder and the CEO of Flash where he provides uh, education and payment infrastructure through lightning the people to uh, assess Bitcoin. As well, he's also in the board of OpenSat, which supports uh, open source projects uh, in the Bitcoin space globally. Hello, Dred. How are you doing? Good. Good. <laughs> Good to see you, Nick. Yeah, welcome to uh, the BC podcast, and we are happy to have you today. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. I'm I'm loving the fact that you guys have um, built a podcast featuring all the different places around the world in Africa that I've always wanted to hear from. So the first two episodes are amazing and I look forward to watching the rest. Awesome. Awesome. Good to have you today too. Um, so we are going to talk because I know you do a lot uh, in the space. So we are going to talk about a range of things. First, we talk about the community which you have built to help promote uh, Bitcoin adoption and of course on the infrastructure side where you also build solutions uh, that helps people make and receive uh, payments on the bitcoin network so before we uh you know start all this discussion i would like you to talk briefly about yourself and you know share how you get started you got started on the bitcoin and also what really inspired you to become a bitcoiner yeah it's always the bitcoiner question right like how did you get into this rabbit hole story yes well, for me, it started from, I guess you could say, very young. I was always, I guess you can call it entrepreneurial minded for one, but also an engineer by trade and by family. I come from a family of engineers. Um, so when I graduated from college, I went into engineering, you know, got a job like everyone else, worked in corporate America for a long time. And during my time in corporate America, I, le I learned from my colleagues what cryptocurrency was, what Bitcoin was, not really what Bitcoin was, but you know, the general Bitcoin exists and you can make money from it. So that's the, you know, everybody knows that story, right? You, you buy some coins, you buy some other coins, you think you know everything, you make some money, you lose a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then you've touched the stove and now you put back on your engineering hat and say, what is this thing really? You know, so I dove into the white paper, um, articles, listening to people like um, Parker Lewis, listening to people like Seyfedina Moose, um, learning what Austrian economics was and how that impacts money and human action. And that kind of took me from a place of gambling to a place of understanding what this technology is, what this discovery is. And then um, right around 2019, 2020 is where I went from education mode i feel like i graduated then you know from my phd in bitcoin and started building 
And I went from building in the you know media space, writing articles about Bitcoin and speaking about Bitcoin, education space, teaching about Bitcoin. And then finally now, the, to your point, the infrastructure space where I'm building for my people, you know, giving them the opportunities to use Bitcoin. So it's been a interesting and long journey with a lot of revelations and mistakes along the way. But uh, I have to say that I am a completely different person because of it. Awesome. Awesome. That's a very, very interesting story. You know, like one of my best parts of this podcast is always hearing people's uh, story. Like you said, what really got you into this uh, rabbit hole and it's always uh, really, really interesting to hear uh, people's uh, story. And uh, like you said, you went from educating people to now building because I also know that most solutions that, that are built on Bitcoin that are always as a result of your personal experience or what you know from the ground, it always uh, serves the, the people the best and the people always connect uh, with it the best. Um, so now let's talk about the community because like you said, you started from education um, because you built the, the Bitcoin, the island Bitcoin community uh, in Jamaica. Can you talk about this, this community and what you do in the community? Sure. So um, we started the island Bitcoin community um, in Jamaica, but the goal is for it to spread across all the Caribbean islands and coastal countries as well of the Caribbean. And um, the high level goal is to really coordinate and help us all have a louder voice as you know, nations in the Caribbean. But the current goal is more fun, right? Like we, we gather together at a, a bar called Summit in Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. So if you're in Jamaica and you want to come to our meetup every third Thursday, come to Summit and come have a drink, come play some board games. Um, there is no obligation. There is no you know formal setting. Everyone comes and chats and learns a little bit about Bitcoin in a very comfortable environment. And that was the goal. And it's really taken off now. We're probably six months deep. We have a core group of people that come and have out and hang out and have fun and spread the word. Probably every month we have two or three new members that join and um, play games and, and hang out and join our Discord and join our WhatsApp group. And WhatsApp is huge in Jamaica. Just like Africa, WhatsApp is a very big communications tool over yeah. you know, iMessage or whatever. So we have a huge WhatsApp following and um, we're starting now to create workshops where people can come to an island Bitcoin workshop and learn all about the fundamentals of Bitcoin, the history of money. And then on top of that, they can download apps, you know, get free sats, test it out, send lightning across the world, like the full gamut of learning about Bitcoin that um, people can do there. It's a little bit more intense than just hanging out and having a beer, but um, it's been working for us. Our next goal for Island Bitcoin is to start a bit devs where we have more of the technical people in the Caribbean, you know, listening in, wanting to learn, but they're programming already, they already know Java or C++ or Rust. And those people now will, will, will have our own little Socratic seminars in the Caribbean and, and join the rest of the world that's doing this together. I'm not making this up, right? This is the same um, template that's been done from Germany to Africa to the South, South America. So we're just joining the line and, and standing on the shoulders of giants here. Wow, awesome. That's uh, really a uh, great work that you are doing there because education is really key uh, because, I mean, most people didn't really get the right education while getting into Bitcoin and that's why they fell into trap and then from the trap before they realized, oh, this is not really the right thing. Let me get to learn the right thing. So always giving people the right education is really important. But I'm also curious to ask, like, how you educate uh, the people? Do you educate them in local languages or how do you uh, carry out the education? Good question. So in Jamaica, we speak um, two main languages. The major language is English, like the Queen's English, since we were a colony of England before we gained our independence. But the second language is more of a dialect. Um, it's a slang called Patois, which is a combination of Portuguese, French, Spanish, and English, but the majority of it is English. So. Um, Jamaicans are grown and raised talking Patois and English, um, but when we're in school, whether it's you know formalized um, primary school or high school, we're taught and 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 educated in the Queen's English. So all of the um, educational events that we've had, the workshops, the meetups, we all do it in English, and we all pass out materials in English. But um, 
one of my goals is to have a nice culturalized, I don't know what to call it, like a localized version of these materials that have a patois or a slang to it where people can, you know, get different examples that they're used to in their own analogies or their own cultural language um, and can can share with community members that can read it to their communities in Patois instead of in English. And I feel like that'll give it a little bit more of a, a connective tissue to spreading yeah. the information. Because one of the things we've realized um, while doing our research in the islands is that a lot of places in rural Jamaica and many other islands, they don't necessarily spread knowledge through books or spread knowledge through, you know, articles or videos or or classes or in the in the classroom it spread through stories through thousands yeah. of years knowledge has been passed down through stories stories from your grandmother stories from your family members from your friends you know like kids that learn about you know the street life they don't learn it through books they learn it from the stories that the elders on the street told them and it's the same concept that we would like to to harness right a lot of people that are learning in Jamaica that not necessarily are very, um, what do you call it? They have a hard time reading or they might have a hard yeah. time seeing. Those type of people are not going to necessarily go to a classroom and learn today. They're going to learn from who's telling them things. And if we can harness that power and have the, the story of Bitcoin and the story of freedom money told through stories, I think that will reach a lot more people than just putting it in a book in Patois. Exactly. I mean, that's a really a very great way for people to connect because when people hear stories and when they, especially like you mentioned, when the connectivity, if people can connect to it via their local languages, it can be explained to them through what they know or what they have experienced. It really, you know, helps them to connect quickly and to also understand. So I'm really looking forward to when you begin all those integration of those Look, uh, localizing it and localizing the content and also the materials and then so people can always uh, connect more. But I am also curious to ask because I know that you have been um, having lots of people, educating lots of people. So how has this um, impacted I mean, financial literacy and financial inclusivity for, for people in the island? So we're early days right now, I would say. The, peop the few people that have come to our meetups or have come to our workshops and learned about Bitcoin, they've just started that early first steps of the rabbit hole, you know? So that means putting in a few dollars, trying it out, seeing if it's safe, deleting and restoring a wallet, you know, seeing if they can send money to friends overseas or use it to buy something on BitRefill. Those, that's the stage we're in right now. But as they do that, they're realizing that they have access to these things that they didn't have access to before. And I'm seeing that spark start to spread. I would anticipate that within a year or less, we'll have people that are using it on a daily basis and probably replacing some of the traditional ways that they're using financial tools with Bitcoin and to either save them money or to let them start businesses that they didn't have possible before. Inflation is a big deal in the yeah. islands. So um, I can imagine that people are going to want to try and um, Com combat or you know battle inflation with a, sta a more stable currency now that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to use bitcoin all the time they might be using stable coins or they might be using the us dollar which happens to be more stable than you know the jamaican dollar or the trinidad um the, or, not, or the the bahamas sand dollar uh, but eventually all roads lead to bitcoin um, as a savings vehicle and each person that we teach understands that over a four year time period, nothing beats Bitcoin. So we're able to really bring people into this now multi-layered approach where before they were just stuck at this volatile Jamaican currency. Now they know, well, I can go from there to the US dollar, to a stable coin, to Bitcoin, to cold storage. And this whole world is here now for me that wasn't there before. So awesome, awesome, awesome. Usually when people start, um, in Bitcoin first, it's usually about trying to understand it. And once they understand it and they see the endless possibilities of Bitcoin and the solutions that Bitcoin can bring to them. And that is always where it really gets started. And the, peop the person we continue to use uh, Bitcoin and of course start to also try to get more people to also have the kind of freedom that uh, Bitcoin has uh, given to them. And also, uh, you also mentioned something about which is like the next question that I wanted 
uh, to ask. I wanted to like ask you what uh, is the solution that Bitcoin really um, provides for people in the Caribbean? Is it uh, remittance? Is it um, trying to save their money from inflation? What's really, or does it equally solve all this uh, problem for them? Because I know that where I come from, it's all this problem that you know Bitcoin is trying to solve, or people are trying to use Bitcoin to solve for themselves. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's it's a two and maybe even three pronged solution that we provide um, to the people in the Caribbean by using Bitcoin. First is inflation. In Jamaica alone, inflation has been recorded at 15%, which is probably not you know a conservative figure compared to what it really is. If you go into the supermarkets in Jamaica and you look at the price of chicken and eggs today compared to what they were last year, it's not going to be a 15% increase. It's going to be like a 30 or 40% increase. Yeah. Electricity costs in Jamaica are already ridiculously high compared to the US or Europe. Maybe Europe's getting up there now with, with the wars over there, but you'd be paying the equivalent of US 40 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity in Jamaica. And that recently just went up by 30% in the last month. That's actually a scandal happening now with the, um, with the current um, Jamaica Public Service Company, which is our power company in Jamaica. And that is across the board, right? You talk about gas prices, you talk about water prices, you talk about um, phone bills. Everything is going up at an almost exponential rate at this point. So it becomes a lot easier to see when <laughs> you compare uh, chicken that went up 30% in US dollars, but went down 15% in Bitcoin price, it's not a very hard um, conversation to yeah. have with a Jamaican to say, just save in Bitcoin, because then it, it solves inflation for you. And then the second thing it solves is the way that they get the money into the country. Remittance and money transfer has always been a very friction-filled thing, right? You have to wait a day or two or three or a week for KYC to be approved. Jamaica has for a long time been on the what we call the gray list for um, the Financial Action Task Force, which is an uh, unelected international body of, of um, people that govern different banks. And if you're not on their green list or white list, I think they call it, then yeah. other corresponding banks don't want to wire transfer money into your country very easily. So that causes a lot of friction for money transfer. Um, Western Union gets around it because they, there's a big company, but they charge you 10, 15, 20% in fees to, to be able to send that money quickly. You might even get um, faster if, and cheaper if you have a bank account. But if you don't have a bank account, you're paying you know, the premium. So what we do is able to, what we do at, at Flash and Bitcoin in general, like you don't have to use Flash. You can use Blink or Wallet of Satoshi or any other wallet and connect with Flash in Jamaica. And you get that money sent via Lightning for virtually free. And then the cash out that you do locally in the country now is just buying and selling Bitcoin. You've removed the whole barrier of friction from yeah. cross-border payments now. And the only thing you're doing is, as Jack Maller says, converting those chips into peanuts or whatever he said in, in his um, presentation to, to the WEF, where it's like the conversion's happening locally. There is, there, it's virtually no more cross-border payment that's happening because everything's happening in cyberspace when the money yeah. is moving. Mm -hmm. So we're using that technology now to cheapen the, um, the cost and lower the friction. And it's already happening. Like people are doing this on a peer-to-peer -peer basis in Jamaica and reaping the rewards. And I can tell you that the few people we have in a closed test right now are very happy. And um, once we are able to do this at a larger scale, I think we'll, we'll realize that the world is shifting from what it used to be in terms of getting money into countries and out of countries and realizing now that money moves across cyberspace. It doesn't move across country lines anymore. Yep. And the world has to adopt this new reality and then eventually govern around it and regulate around it. But first they have to realize it's happening. And I think that's our advantage as Bitcoiners. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, great. And I mean, well outlined. And I can completely relate to everything you said about inflation, about remittance about money losing value i can come because it's very very uh, similar to what we have in nigeria and many other uh, african countries and it's really easy when people understand bitcoin that bitcoin really solves uh, this remittance problem or this inflation 
and problem but it's always best when people experience it they see how bitcoin solves it and then that's always when they believe and then you know they begin to uh, try to dig more to understand more and of course some people go as far as trying to really understand how the monetary system works and when they do it and read books like the bitcoin standard that is when <laughs> they will now you know really understand and their eye will be open to uh, a lot of uh, things you um, mentioned nigeria and there's another tangential i wouldn't call it problem but a tangential competitive technology that bitcoin also you know almost obsoletes nigeria right. has had e naira in circulation or tried to have it in circulation for a long mm -hmm. time and has been resoundly rejected by the citizens of Nigeria, yeah. even though they've tried to push it on people and try to remove the cash from the society and <clears throat> a lot of different tactics that the central bank has taken on in Nigeria. Well, it's been very, very similar in Jamaica. They've had a thing called the, um, the CBDC is called what? Jamdex. That's the uh, Jamaican version of the e Nairo. And they did the same thing. They pushed it hard. They spent millions of dollars advertising, giving away free money to use it, trying to push businesses to use it. Um, they tried to, you know, push the cashless society where you only have to use that. And same as Nigeria, the Jamaican said, no, we do not believe you. We're not going to use your, your yeah. government money. Yeah. The less than 2% adoption right now in terms of trying to use their um, CBDC. And uh, I, I, I don't think, I think they're going to still try because, you know, they're never really going to give up since they have endless money to keep on trying, right? Well, virtually endless money, even though it's not real money, it's printed money. But mm -hmm. they're going to keep on trying until until we, we have a better solution. And I think just like Nigeria, where Bitcoin adoption rates are through the roof, um, Jamaica is going to follow suit soon enough, as soon as they have the opp opportunity to do so. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to that point. I mean, in Nigeria, they have even retried to, re to rebrand the Inaira to collaborate with some people that say that maybe they can push it and then they try it and it's still uh, the same problem that people don't want to use it. It doesn't solve the problem. So mm -hmm. people will not uh, use it. And most Nigerians who are well educated about Bitcoin, about um, how digital money works, they know well enough and they know that it really doesn't um, solve uh, the problem for them. So uh, now talk about the experience because I myself uh, is also an educator and I have also interacted with a lot of persons trying to teach them about uh, Bitcoin. Just like my question about uh, the problem that Bitcoin solves for the people in the Caribbean. So are there like perceptions uh, about Bitcoin that maybe uh, that you encounter while uh, educating uh, people in Jamaica about Bitcoin? Yeah. And these are the hardest things to do, right? Is is um, change people's perceptions or <clears throat> change their opinions after they've already had a first impression, especially if it's a bad first impression. So Jamaica is known for a lot of good things. You know, we're known for great reggae music. We're, we're known for talented sportsmen and women. Um, we're known for beautiful tourist country of beaches and weather. We're also known for a lot of um, unscrupulous individuals calling poor elderly people in the U.S. trying to scam them out of lottery, you know, a, a lottery scheme. Like, you've won the lottery. Send me so-and-so money. And it's it's unfortunately an a infamous thing um, in the island. And there's a culture of of unscrupulousness or scamming that is that is systematic. It's not just like, you know, individuals that are running around scamming people. It is, it is within our institutions. It is, um, you know, across our businesses. There used to be a company called Olint that ran a, a multi-level marketing scheme. It was a, official, right? Commercials on TV. And it was a pyramid scheme that fell apart mm -hmm. eventually and people went to jail. Um, another one was called Cash Plus. It's the same thing. It's just, it's an unfortunate culture that, a subculture that exists in the society that where people know, okay, well, scams are around and scams are, are prevalent. So when they hear something like cryptocurrency and they hear about Bitcoin, we already know that there was a whole phase of ICO scams. Then there was a phase of the NFT grifters within the art space. So the scamming has, has been prevalent within the cryptocurrency space too. 
So as Jamaicans who are already traumatized from the scamming in the country are hearing about all the scamming in cryptocurrency, there's this double, you know, like a two, a one-two punch of why should I trust what you're saying to me every time I try to educate people on Bitcoin, especially because it's not like they have a lot of discretionary funding to to spend on on, on a gamble or a bet, right? If I had an extra hundred dollars and you told me this thing might work and I thought it might be a scam, but I know I could risk the hundred dollars, I still might listen to you. If this is the only hundred dollars I have for the month and you're telling me that you have something to show me and I, I think it might be a scam, I'm not listening to you at all. Yeah. I'm not even going to try and understand what you're saying because I don't have, you know. So that's what we're facing right now. I think we're facing more of a, a risk averse culture where people aren't ready to really listen to what you have to say. But what I've found is once you're able to put people in, put a group of whether it's an individual or a small group of people or even a large group of people in a very comfortable environment where they don't feel like they're risking anything to learn, they don't feel like they're risking any, anything to listen to something new, that's when we're able to actually have um, honest conversations about what Bitcoin is versus what crypto is, um, the scams that have happened in the past and the, the bright orange future that is actually on the other side of all of these scams. And then once they get past that hurdle, then they go down the rabbit hole very fast. Um, because they see the opportunity from a third world perspective, not from a first world investment thesis strategy, right? They see it from a, oh, this solves my immediate problems, right? This can actually help me get out of the 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 trap that I'm in, the the fiat trap that I'm in. So um, yeah, I would say that's the difference. The difference is getting people past that first big wall of skepticism is always the hardest. But once you get past that wall, the education flows easier than it even does in a first world country. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. I mean, I don't need to say much here because it's very, very similar to what <laughs> we also have uh, there in, in our country and many other um, parts of Africa. It's always uh, really tough because, like you said, they've already experienced or heard from a friend or from a family about being scammed, maybe they invested in crypto and something like that. So it's always uh, a big problem to, you know, to cross. Once they cross it, like you said, you know, it's always uh, a free fl flow for them. And it's always about experience. Once they get to experience the real thing and the how the Bitcoin solves their immediate problem, then that's us always where um, their starting point about trying to learn more and trying to use Bitcoin and then trying to uh, grow uh, in the space. I mean, I wanted to ask you about the challenges you 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 used to have in when you're educating people, but I think you already have touched it. But are there other challenges that you have apart from the perception? Are there any other challenges that you encounter while trying to educate? Yeah, I would say um, the other challenges are finding others that will help me to educate. We're a very small group of people that actually have what I would call rabbit hole or Bitcoiner level knowledge, like enough knowledge to get past the, you know, buy this on Coinbase, you know, enough knowledge to talk about why self-custody is important, enough knowledge to talk about why the supply cap, you know, is one of the most important features of Bitcoin c compared to other currencies. That level of knowledge is not very, it's, it's scarce. <laughs> That's the best yeah. I can put it. It's as scarce as Bitcoin. <laughs> so finding, finding other teachers, I would say, is also a big challenge that I have. Um, sure, I can go on a podcast or I can do an online workshop or I can go to a, a physical space and, and do, a, do a workshop. But that's only get reaching a certain number of people. And maybe the solution is to have a bigger online presence. I don't know. But I do know that um, me being the only person in Jamaica that's trying to push this, or there's a few people now, two or three, but it's not a lot. And I, I would say that's the challenge that I have is scaling. Scaling to have enough people spreading the word, talking about Bitcoin, teaching people that are teaching the right things and not just telling people to go on Binance and try your luck. Yeah, I think, uh, and I can suggest to you, it's like scaling is not easy, especially when you are the only one um, starting. So I think maybe what you can do is to try to educate educators, maybe people that are interested in, you try to build them up, get them to a really good level, 
and then maybe you can try to spread them to other parts, maybe to carry out events and try to begin education on that part. And I mean, step by step, you are going to have more people, you are going to have an army, and then you can be able to work with them to uh, promote um, Bitcoin education. It's not easy, but you're already doing it. And then I know you're also going to do uh, a lot more um, for, for the people in the Caribbean. I like the way yeah. you said that because my, I have a, a good friend and also an educator um, named D++. I don't know if you know her or not, um, but she's creating an open source template for a program called Train the Trainer. As you said, she's teaching the teachers how to teach Bitcoin. So I'm looking forward to that as well, to see if there's a template where we can like duplicate ourselves by just having them go through a course that shows them how to teach communities and how to teach groups on, on the fundamentals of Bitcoin. Awesome. awesome. I'll also be looking forward to that and seeing how um, it's executed because it usually works. It usually works and it's going to be really um, helpful. So I think we've had really had a very, very insightful conversation about the education part, about the community part. And now let's talk about the other thing you do in the Caribbean, which is uh, providing uh, infrastructure. And I also know that you founded uh, Flash that, um, okay, I just tell, about, tell us about Flash and uh, what Flash does for the people in the Caribbean. Yeah, so it's my company Flash. Um, I started it as a dream about two and a half years ago because I went to El Salvador and I saw the way that El Salvador was growing as a community, first of all, in the Bitcoin Beach area, which is El Zante, south of San Salvador. It's a small community, you know, a few thousand people at most, and they were doing nothing else except, you know, accepting Bitcoin, paying in Bitcoin, and being able to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. That's all the circular economy really was at the end of the day. It's using it as a medium of exchange instead of anything else. When I saw that working, I realized that Bitcoin had gotten to a point where um, it wasn't theoretical anymore. This can actually work in real life in communities that needed it the most. It didn't have to happen in a fully built out, you know, Wall Street, New York style place with tap to pay and, you know, banking solutions for every. None of that was needed. Like some of these stores didn't have internet access properly. Or some of these stores were, you know, very in rural areas of, of El Salvador and it was working. So that made me um, really start pushing hard on, on getting the infrastructure set up in Jamaica because I wanted to have the same solution. I wanted to have a circular economy in Jamaica along the beaches where people can buy, sell, trade, earn and, and live off of Bitcoin. Um, but we didn't have this, uh, what would I say? We didn't have the same resources or benefactors that the El Salvador, yeah. <laughs> El Salvador <laughs> community had. So I had, it took it upon myself to do that instead. But instead of actually just donating Bitcoin directly, I didn't say, instead decided to donate the infrastructure, right? Build it so that we had on-ramps and off-ramps. Because you can't bring an ATM into Jamaica similar to how you could in El Salvador. So you yeah. couldn't have a Bitcoin on-ramp and off-ramp ATM just chilling um, in Kingston. So I had to build a company that allowed people to take their Jamaican dollars, hand it to someone, and get Bitcoin in exchange. Or take their Bitcoin, scan a QR code, and get Jamaican dollars in exchange. And that company is called Flash. And we're making it so that it's easy for people to do it via cash. You can do it via tap-to-pay card. We have these really cool tap-to-pay cards here. That really? are using, yeah, it's using Lightning. So if you know about the LN URL um, protocol, it, that's all it is. It's tap to pay using um, the Bolt card spec. If you go to boltcard.org, you can find out all about the spec. If you want to build it, it's self-hostable. Everything we use in Flash is open source. So we're using um, open source code from Blink. We're using open source libraries from Breeze. We're using open source yeah. infrastructure um, and lightning as a service solutions from Ibex. Um, and then we're building our own open source, our own open source backend and our own open source Noster DM um, solution. So if you want inside of the app now, you can connect to Noster, you can use your, your keys to connect and you can chat with other Noster developers or Noster users and even Zap if you want to. So it's a full solution for Jamaicans, but you know, most Jamaicans are like, what? Noster, Zap, what is all that? 
doesn't matter. If you're Jamaican, yeah. the one thing you need to know is that you can exchange your money for Bitcoin now without needing a US account, without yeah. needing a cash app or a you know a friend in, in, in the US that can help you out to buy your Bitcoin. Now you're going to be able to do it with the money you earn at home. I mean, it is really um, amazing work you are doing. It's also really, really amazing because you're also starting the right education and then you follow, follow it up with infrastructure. And this infrastructure is the one that you built because you really have the experience and how it really works in Jamaica. Not like maybe you are trying to do the education and maybe you are trying to use other exchanges or other people that have maybe sat somewhere and imagine how it is in Jamaica and build something and say, okay, people in the Caribbean um, can use it. So it's really amazing that as you're educating the people, there is also an infrastructure that you have that is built in a way that it suits them. So when they get into it, they won't find it very, very difficult. They won't find maybe if, if there is maybe KYC or how to get started, they won't find it um, very strange or very, very uh, difficult to do. So that's really uh, an amazing work you do. And um, makes me to ask you now, it, is it only in uh, Jamaica and within the Caribbean or can it be used anywhere globally? Yeah, for now, we're starting off slow because we want to make sure that you know we're able to get, provide support to each one of our customers. Our customers are like the most important people in the world to me right now. So we're starting in Jamaica only. Then we're going to spread out to the Cayman Islands and then a few other islands along the way. Uh, I don't think we'll ever end up in places like the U.S. or Europe, but there's nothing stopping us from continuing to spread around the world as we become bigger or to integrate because... We're building on an open source network, right? The open source monetary network of Bitcoin connects with every other Bitcoin business out there. And every other Bitcoin business that grows their customers, they're also growing our customers. Um, so I'm not really concerned about everywhere in the world will be, um, even though I'm not opposed to being everywhere in the world. But I want to make sure that the people that we've built the product for which are the Jamaicans and the Caribbean people that are currently locked out of this economy, we're making sure that we're solving all of their problems first. So it's going to be very customized to their solutions, um, to their issues. And, um, and then after we've solved everything that they want, <laughs> then we might move on to other places. I completely agree with you. Please don't look at any other person yet. Just build it uh, for them and make it really easy for them because Customer experience and also onboarding is one of the key problems uh, in the Bitcoin uh, products. Like I said, you build it customized for, for Jamaicans and for the Caribbeans and don't just look at anywhere else now and just continue to uh, build it uh, for them. And um, I also wanted to, uh, you know, to ask you, because you mentioned uh, something about the, the tap to pay card you have and also about secular economies. Are there like shops uh, in Jamaica or in the Caribbean that are already maybe accepting Bitcoin or trying to use Flash to make a transaction for their day-to-day -day life? So the first question, accepting Bitcoin, yes. There are a few boutique stores. There's a Pizza Please, which is a pizza franchise that accept Bitcoin. And they do it you know, in their own way, right? They probably have a Bitcoin wallet whether it's Blue Wallet or Wallet of Satoshi, and they keep the Bitcoin and then they go off and spend it how they please. They're not converting it into local dollars or they're not paying any bills or you know running typical cash flow with that Bitcoin. However, there are no businesses yet using Flash in an open sense. We have three businesses right now that are doing closed testing for our new product, which is called the Flash Point. And the Flash Point is, uh, I don't have any here with me, but it's basically a point of sale solution mm. um, using only Bitcoin. So you can have this point of sale machine, the terminal in front of you, and they can you know, write up the receipt for whatever you're buying from them and you can tap to pay on their device. And then their device will give them a report at the end of the day with all the Bitcoin that they've collected. And then they can head hit another button that cashes them out. And what does that do? That sends a percentage of the Bitcoin, whether it's all of it or a percentage, to Flash, and Flash in exchange gives them fiat dollars so they can pay their bills or you know restore their inventory or whatever they need to do to continue running their business. So this gives them that full solution of you know 
Bitcoin um, acceptance, but still able to pay fiat bills and then keep their balance sheets in Bitcoin if they want to. That was never possible before until we've built this solution for them. And that's going to be launching in December in public. But right now we're in, we're in closed trial until, yeah, for three months until December. So by the time I get to, to Nairobi, I probably should be announcing that we have some public stores in Kingston that are accepting using their flashpoints. Okay, I know. I know. Uh, when I asked you about um, if you want to go beyond uh, Jamaica or beyond the Caribbean, I was telling you, okay, don't look at other countries and stuff like that. But but now I'm taking back my word. Can you <laughs> please can you include Nigeria and African countries in your plans, please? So, because I think this solution is really amazing and is what we need and is what most people are also really trying to build in, in, in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. So please, 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 I take back my word, please include, include Nigeria and uh, Africa in, 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 your, in your plans because it's really, really, really um, amazing. Okay, now let's um, talk about, uh, we've talked about your work in the community. We also talked about really, really, really amazing uh, infrastructure that you are providing uh, in the Caribbean. So aside all these things, you also sit uh, on the board of uh, OpenSAT, which supports uh, open source uh, projects. How important is it right now to support uh, Bitcoin projects uh, globally? Oh man, it's hard to understate how important, hard to overstate how important it is to support open source projects but I'll give you a featured highlight on why it's so important. Um, and that includes this card, the same tap to pay flash card I'm talking about, and probably a good third of the infrastructure that we are providing our business solutions in Jamaica with this product is built on a specific open source piece of software called BTC Pay Server. BTC Pay Server has been around for a while and it's, been, it's evolved into a very, very efficient and, and useful tool that um, open source uh, is completely open source funded. They've collected grants. They've never, you know, became an actual company. They're a nonprofit. And, and OpenStats is very proud to be a repeat um, grant sponsor of, of BTC Pay Server. If it wasn't for companies like BTC Pay Server, a lot of businesses around the Bitcoin space wouldn't be able to be, wouldn't be able to move as fast as they do. They wouldn't be able to be as um, resistant to, um, controlling entities as they are. And I think that that is the difference between, you know, the, the corporate space and the open source and more importantly, the, this new technology, this new, um, movement into freedom money and freedom technology that we're, that we're seeing right now, that wouldn't exist if it solely depended on VC money and solely depended on, you know, government subsidies or any kind of other individual sponsorships or funding. Um, Open, OpenSats is very proud to be a 100% pass-through nonprofit that is almost no strings attached. We don't tell our grantees exactly what they should be doing and we don't drive them into any one direction that we want them to go. We're funding based on very simple criteria, which you can see on our mission statement. And it's making sure that the software is free and open source, yeah. available for anyone to use. And the license has to be there, whether it's MIT license, a GPL license, or a Creative Commons license, if it's an educational platform. And then it has to actually, uh, what I call, so solve the um, tragedy of the commons, which is if you have a a, a problem that needs to be solved, but n no one person can solve it. It's like a problem for the community, but it doesn't, it doesn't reward any one person for solving it. Then everyone has to come together to solve this problem, like streetlights, for example, right? No one person is going to walk around and put up streetlights without getting paid, but you know, everyone in the community is not going to put up their own streetlight. So that's something that you would, in a government set setting, you would have the government pay for, but even in an open source setting, you know, you would need something a little bit more decentralized to pay for it. And that's where we come in. We come in at, at the protocol level. Um, think Core Lightning, think LND, think LDK, you know, think BTC Pay Server. Think all of these, you know, core level, protocol level, or middleware level tools that need to be built in order for Flash to exist, in order for, you know, BitKnob or Yellow Card or, 
any of these other companies to exist, we need these kind of, you know, pipings underneath us that's already built. So um, we're really proud to be sponsoring a lot of these type of um, projects. We're also proud to be sponsoring, um, to be funding Bitcoin core developers. Um, we have long-term support grants for some of the best Bitcoin core developers in the industry, giving them a little bit more security so that they feel like, you know, they're, they're working on something that the, the community cares about and, and they're going to continue working on it so that we have uh, a maintained uh, core instead of, you know, <laughs> it falling apart eventually because of lack of funding. And then lastly, the thing that I'm more pr most proud of is our recent education initiative. I lead that and that's helping not just the developers gain knowledge and learn more about Bitcoin or learn more about um, maintaining or coding Bitcoin or Lightning or Noster, but also it's top of the pipeline, like top of the funnel, as they put it. So you can have people who know nothing about Bitcoin and we can and we're building or funding companies and projects that are building um, open source content that anyone can freely see. Um, Mid Premier Bitcoin is a great example of that. You know, they're all over Africa and South America and now in the Caribbean, and they're yeah. translating into, I don't know how many languages, not thousands of languages, that's an exaggeration, but probably dozens and dozens of languages um, and dialects to your point, like Patois could be something they um, translate into. They're, they're translating into Haitian Creole so that uh, people in Haiti can actually use, uh, read and learn from Mid Premier Bitcoin. Um, so we're really happy to be funding projects like that, that not only get the developers out and get the protocol level um, piping out, but also get the education out so everyone can freely and, and um, easily use it. Um, awesome. That's really uh, great work that OpenSAT uh, is doing there because I also wanted to ask you a question about how do you um, select the project you support, which you, you also answered. And also, I also wanted to ask you um, what is the most exciting uh, project that you have supported? But you also mentioned BTC Pay Server, which now looks like that's the the most uh, exciting um, project that you have supported. Because, like you said, the importance of uh, open source uh, funding cannot be overstated. Because I have seen it, and in the last two to three years in African region, there is a lot of funding that has been given to builders to developers and I can see that it was like an explosion of solutions, explosions of communities and try, people trying to promote education, to build solutions and uh, stuff like that. So when you say that it cannot be overstated, I completely agree because you know, I mean, see it. I will give some clarity though for logistics around how we select projects. Uh, we, we have a nine member board and of that nine member board, we have a majority vote that happens on every project. So five of nine votes have to be positive for that project uh -huh. to be approved. Uh -huh. um, and each one of the mem uh, members are, you know, have our individual votes. There is no leaning towards one direction or another, no grouping. Um, so I, I feel like we have a very, a very good system of, of keeping votes fair. Yeah. Um, we also have subcommittees for each, each category of votes so that experts in the space can do deep research on the individual or the project to make sure that a project is viable, a project is, is a real project and has proof of work before pushing into any kind of vote. So we make sure that every dollar that we push to projects are, are well spent. You know, they're, they're going towards projects that are worth um, having the grant. And then in terms of a favorite project, big BTC pay server would be my favorite project, but I would call myself biased since I'm using <laughs> BTC pay server. And to that point, um, we do have a conf conflict of interest clause where if there are projects that we are financially gaining from or have, you know, any kind of um, attachment to in terms of ownership or management, we recuse ourselves from voting on that project. So it keeps every single vote fair to make sure that if you are part of a project in it all, you don't get a vote to say whether that project gets funded. Um, it makes sure that only the people who are objective towards a project will be voting towards it. That's really a very good and transparent and really strong uh, system to select a project or product to, to support. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, now we have really talked about uh, a lot of things about your work and then also about uh, open sites and the work, awesome work that um, you are doing there as well. So uh, now let's talk about the future. So 
after like everything that we have discussed so how do you now see the future about bitcoin uh in caribbean and also extending uh globally um so i've i've come full circle or maybe 180 degrees i would say where before my own journey down the bitcoin rabbit hole i was kind of nihilistic in terms of the future um thinking that yeah it didn't really make sense to try and plan too far ahead. You weren't sure what direction, you know, both locally and internationally, the world was turning. Um, with Bitcoin now and with the infrastructure that I'm building out and the infrastructure infrastructure and tools I see everyone else building out. And I will say even with Noster as another tool um, that is even, you know, broader than Bitcoin, I would say, in terms of communications freedom and the, and the freedom to be able to choose as opposed to being told by an algorithm what to believe, what to ingest as information and what to react to. Um, Jack has quoted it as free will as opposed to, you know, free choice. And I think that gives me a lot more positivity, a lot more optimism about the future. I feel like we're going into a phase where there can be a short, dark period during a conversion of sorts, but there also can be a lot of bright spots and eventually a very, very beautiful age of abundance that I see coming for us. And um, that could happen at the fringes first. I feel like a lot of countries that are taking on the chance of adopting the Bitcoin strategy or the Bitcoin um, balance sheet, you know, the kingdom of Bhutan, El Salvador, um, a lot of these countries are doing it first and they're reaping the rewards. And I think it's from those edges we're going to see bright spots that shine and, and empires that build up. And then um, the world will change, but it'll change for the better. Um, so I'm happy. I'm happy to be a part of it. I do think that we have to be vigilant, though. I think that this is not going to be an easy road. There's always going to be, um, con not conflict, what's what I'm looking for, friction in terms of change. Um, you know, one of the phrases I like to use is that people... Um, won't change unless the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. Um, and people are very, very comfortable right now. So the pain of, of change is, is pretty high. Um, but there'll become a tipping point where a lot of that will change. And I'm glad that we're all here for it. I'm glad that we're all shepherds helping people to, to guide them through this change. And um, I just, I'm very humbled to be part of this, op part of this group that you, me, everybody else that, we'll, that we're working with to, to help the rest of the world um, get to the point that we, we think they can be, which is sound money, which is money that no longer takes advantage of human beings, but instead of human, instead of the human beings being able to you know, benefit from the money. Awesome. awesome. I completely uh, agree and relate to everything that uh, you have said, because I mean, we're all looking forward and hoping that we're going to really have, you know, that future that uh, Bitcoin gives and that way that Bitcoin has paved for people to really have uh, their freedom and be able to control maybe their money, their freedom and what, you know, what they take in or what they try to, to process. And I mean, we'll all be there in the future and like you are doing really great work to make this happen. And... Yeah, so um, I know that uh, you you already mentioned um, about the latest project that you're building and that you you you're saying it will come live in uh, December. Because I wanted to ask you about what are the next project or what are the things that you are looking forward to to work on right now. So I don't know maybe if there is anything else added to that. That's always a a tough question because I am a futurist. Um, by hobby, right? I, I like to look at what future technologies are out there, um, what's exciting um, that, you know, could potentially be the next, you know, not necessarily the next big thing, but next cool thing that, that might make a small thing you're doing in the world a little easier or a little more efficient. And I got to say that there's probably four or five projects out there that I'm, I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in what's happening in the eCash space. I'm really interested in what's happening in the AI space. I'm really interested in what's happening in the robotics space. Um, but I think that a lot of those areas, um, especially AI and robotics, 
need to have a lot more open source contributors that are are pushing you know that side of the scale if we have everything in closed source corporate vc money um and ip you know regulate regulations then um we're going to end up with one product where if we have you know the, the same people who worked on things like linux people who worked on things like mozilla if we have a group of people that are focused on pushing technology forward in an open source methodology then I feel like we're going to see, uh, again, a, a lot of abundance in technology based on these based on these things put, being pushed forward in the right way. So I don't know what my next project will be. I'm really 100% focused on the Flash right now. Yeah. But what about, whatever my next project will be and everything else I work on going forward, I'm, it's going to be open source based for sure. So because I mean, open source is freedom. And I know that I mean, you there and you already understand how it works and what you know freedom really means and what's having people having easy access especially to to, to money means so just looking forward to when you uh bring on and i mean hopefully hopefully we are going to see uh in kenya and by then you're also going to be announcing uh that latest project that you're building on flash and hopefully you consider my appeal and maybe include nigeria and other african countries so that we can be able to uh, test it out uh, there in Kenya. Thank you so much for making out time to join. This has been very, very uh, productive and insightful uh, conversation. And I know that everyone who listens to this podcast is going to, the person is going to learn a lot, the person is going to see a lot, and the person will be motivated to uh, do a lot. So thank you so much uh, for joining today and hoping to see you in Kenya for the African Bitcoin Conference. It's my pleasure, Nick. Thank you for inviting me and looking forward to seeing you there too. Thank you Cheers. so much. Yeah.